Good morning, everyone. This is Tom George with the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association. I want to thank you for joining us today for this webinar. Um, I'd like to ask the participants to mute their mics, or the presenters to mute their mics, and uh, any of you that are participants, you'll be able to pose questions through instant messaging feature. Uh, Mary O'Connor with the National Institution of Occupational Safety and Health and the Alaskan Aviation Safety Foundation will be compiling questions to ask to the presenters uh, at the end of presentations. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Dave Kosovar for an introduction to this session. Take it away, Dave. All right. Thank you, Tom. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. And this session also is being recorded so that we'll be able to uh, post it for later viewing for people that weren't able to dial in today. All right, great. Thank you, Tom, for that introduction, and thank you, uh, everyone, for joining us uh, this morning or this afternoon, wherever you're, you're dialing in from. Um, we would have uh, very much uh, um, preferred to be meeting everybody in person. Uh, the, the originally scheduled time that we had last week for this, this uh, workshop that we had been planning um, but obviously, due to, to reasons beyond our control, that was not possible. So thank you for the time, uh, or taking the time to, uh, um, to make for us uh, this week instead. Uh, I realize many of you are, are probably very, very busy right now, um, you know, working with contingency plans and uh, just response to, to everything happening in our world right now. So uh, very much appreciate the time and uh, the attention um, that you're giving to, to the, the few topics that we'll be presenting today. Um, so my name is Dave Kochevar. I'm with the National Weather Service Alaska Region Headquarters, where I'm the uh, Regional Aviation Meteorologist. Uh, and I was a part of the, the organizing committee um, that had been planning the workshop that we're, we were doing last week. Um, and so one of the ideas that we had come up with um, when we decided to postpone that workshop until the fall was to um, start doing these, these short um, webinars for uh, some of the topics that we felt really couldn't wait into the fall um, to be, to be um, you know, discussed within the aviation community. So this is the, the first of what we hope to be uh, a few webinars, assuming, assuming today goes well, um, uh, where we can present um, some of the exciting work that's happening uh, in Alaska with regards to aviation weather right now. Uh, so the first topic that we chose to be uh, discussed is a um, kind of an exciting um, topic and concept that a few folks with uh, FAA flight standards uh, and with the FAA webcam program have been working on uh, collaboratively uh, for quite some time now called the, the VFR weather network concept uh, that we, we really feel is going to help um, bring some uh, increased high quality uh, weather information to the state of Alaska uh, in, in a way that could potentially um, be rolled out much faster than, than we have in the past. So um, the two topics we'll be having will be just kind of an introduction of that VFR weather network. Uh, and the two speakers we'll be having for that are John Steventon and our Gordon Rother with FAA Flight Standards in Washington, DC. And then uh, as a part of that presentation, we're also going to have Walter Combs from the FAA webcam program um, discuss a, a, a project he's been working on with his webcam network uh, called the Validated Weather Observing System uh, that's sort of tied to that VFR weather network. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, pass this off to uh, Gordy and John. Hey, good afternoon. Hi, I'll give you a second here to, to unmute. Um, and thank you for the introduction. I'm John Stevenson, and I work in AFS 400 uh, in, in DC. And uh, I think Gordy is um, going to start off the presentation here, and uh, I'll pick up somewhere in the middle. Sure. Uh, can you hear me now? Loud and clear. OK, good. Yeah, I want to make sure I was pushing the right buttons here. Um, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Gordy Rother. I work in AFS 220 Air Carrier Operations out of Washington, D.C., and um, 
prior to my work in uh, 200, uh, I, I had John's position in 400, the technologies branch, and, and we work uh, very closely together. And our effort has been, you know, to try to improve uh, the weather reporting and forecasting, um, primarily in the state of Alaska, but we've got a lot of other irons in the fire with uh, UAS and, and the lower 48, too. Um, so I guess, Tom, are you running the slides, or am I going to try to request control, or um, just say next slide? Either way works. They should be up. If you want to grab control, you should be able to advance them yourself, or just call for it, and I'll do it. Okay. Okay. Um, well, let's see. Take over as presenter, I guess. I'm hoping I did the wrong thing. Maybe I did the wrong thing. Yeah, just give it a minute. All right. Did it go to slide number two? Yep, you're there. Okay. All right, today's agenda, uh, four items here. Talk a little bit about the uh, weather observation shortfall, focus on the state of Alaska. Uh, uh, Walter will be uh, giving us a uh, briefing on the VWAS system as an affordable alternative. Talk about uh, the plans to roll that out and, uh, and what, what's going to happen this June, and then further on in this September to do some additional validation. Right now there are 136 total, for, total certified weather reporting systems in the state of Alaska. Um, and each, each system, each AWOS, is valid for 78, 78 and a half roughly square miles per sensor array. Um, it covers roughly 650, uh, or it, it leaves about 652,592 square miles of uncovered uh, airspace in Alaska, uh, which is about 98.3% of the state. They don't have an approved source of weather. So that's, uh, that's higher than the lower 48, obviously, and, uh, but, but still uh, that issue is not unique, but uh, definitely more challenging to cover the airspace in Alaska than it is in the lower 48. So we've looked at some potential solutions, and uh, we're, uh, we've got some proposals for what we'd like to see as the outcome. This is just a snapshot of the AWOS ASOS for, for the Alaska area right now. And uh, in a zoom in on that, you can get a better, better detail of uh, the, the limited amount of uh, airspace that's really covered. And uh, so the, the lacking of uh, weather reporting has, has been a huge issue uh, in Alaska. Um, it's, it's, the lack of weather reporting has, uh, has widespread operational and economic impacts. Uh, the accidents and uh, fatalities are directly attributable to that. Um, currently, right now, there are 23 airports with uh, standard instrument approach procedures in Alaska, but no METARs. Uh, additional 112 airports that need weather information and overall, there's 157 airports that uh, do not have terminal area forecasts or observations will not support them. So where are we going? Um, well, right now we have the gold standard. We have the AWOS and ASOS. And it's the only approved source of weather. Um, it's only for IFR operations. Uh, it's a, it only uses FAA-approved sensors that are allowed to be uh, um, part of that uh, system. Only FAA technicians are authorized to certify those, those devices. Um, new technologies are, are smothered by the FAA constraints. So there's a lot of new technology that, uh, that uh, Walters looked at uh, and that, that's current, available today, or, or in the, on the horizon as far as communications go. Um, the industry has been reluctant to establish other solutions because the FAA will not approve that. We've, we've seen that at, at time and time again in meetings. Um, so what we need was a, a basically the silver standard, and that's what we're, we're going to propose. The AWAS um, is an expensive little device. It's about $1.2 million per copy in Alaska. Um, the Airport Improvement Plan, the AIP funding, plans to fund approximately 35 systems over the next 10 years. Um, recently, legislation's changed on that. Um, the FAA is not funding other, any other new AWAS systems, so it's still going to leave a significant gap in the, in the need. Um, and there's no viable solutions on the horizon for, to uh, increase that. 
Uh, as I'm sure you guys can uh, appreciate, the, your, the industry up there has been kind of exasperated with uh, the problems. NTSB has made recommendations to increase the weather observations in Alaska. Uh, the industry has seeked congressional intercession. Um, Congress has responded. Uh, the, the three three kind of key things that have happened over the past uh, two years, really, uh, were the change to AIP funding. And AIP funding never used to allow for the weather devices. It was uh, basically uh, concrete and, uh, and mortar type of uh, funding. And so now that's been opened up to AWOS and it's, um, it allows the um, funds of state sponsored AWOS be, um, to be transferred to the FAA maintenance uh, program. So to be under the, um, the gold standard umbrella there. Uh, in 2019, House Joint Resolution 31, Section 119F was passed into public law. It allows 121 carriers to operate without terminal uh, without or operate into terminal areas uh, under VFR without a METAR or a TAF as long as they have approved procedures. Uh, I can tell you I've worked through this with uh, uh, a few of the carriers up there through the Denali CMO. Um, they have some pretty sound procedures, but uh, operating without weather is, is not an equivalent standard to operating with weather. So we've been we've been looking uh, for years into how to how to increase this and and we think we've come up with a pretty good idea, or at least a couple options anyway. And then again, uh, shortly after that, uh, HR sec, uh, 302 bill, um, section 322 was expanded to allow 135 air carriers to conduct an instrument approach without a destination retire. And, and so that, that, that uh, it was similar to the 121, but that allowed uh, 135 to operate uh, into these airports without, um, uh, without uh, on an IFR approach without weather. So potential solutions, what are we here to talk about? Um, the VWAS, the Visual Weather Observation System. It's a uh, weather camera's uh, site. It's upgraded with a new 360 degree pan tilt and zoom uh, camera and uh, an array of, uh, of uh, certified sensors. So it's a low cost uh, AWAS with cameras. So uh, we see this as a, as a significant upgrade to a METAR. The other, the other uh, thing we've been working on, and John will talk about this next, is um, uh, evaluation of National Weather Service uh, model data called real-time metal scale analysis. RTMA is a, is a product that's run every 15 minutes at the Weather Service and provides a gridded, um, well, basically gridded uh, METAR type information uh, across the United States and Alaska. Uh, so our analysis is, is we've, we're asking the National Weather Service, the uh, um, uh, environmental, um, the, the uh, EMC folks out in Boulder to evaluate it and tell us how good it is. How does it compare to the AWAS? So we've had one year's worth of, of, of information and, and uh, John's going to elaborate on that a little bit more. Um, there's also a third option. The third option would be uh, the industry to develop their own uh, validated weather observation system, a uh, system that uh, be similar to Walter's but uh, meet, a, meet a design specification, uh, would be open source, would allow the industry to build a lower, lower cost AWAS than, uh, uh, than, than we currently have right now. So uh, a few options on the table, and this would uh, this would definitely in, increase the, the weather reporting in Alaska, cover the, you know, fill the gaps where there's no current weather information. It would allow us to work with the National Weather Service to expand some weather reporting or weather forecasting um, uh, products. Uh, I, some of you might be familiar with the AAG product, um, but it would, it would allow us to expand that and you, so it would, you'd get weather reporting and forecasting. So. That's kind of the goal and the direction we're headed. Um, I'm going to let uh, John speak to slide 11, and then, or, and then we'll uh, turn it over to Walter. Yes, good afternoon. So in, in uh, AFS 400, uh, we have a technical committee uh, representatives group um, budget for weather research. There's several TCRGs throughout the FA, and our small uh, budget of weather 
we support several projects, and RTMA being one of those. Um, the first year analysis, uh, like a Gordy admission, showed a lot of positive results. Uh, and they're, um, we're looking at a second year statement of work, um, and that's going to focus more in regional areas um, outside of those ASOS and AWAS uh, areas that we're currently doing some research in. Um, being a uh, flown up and I lived in Alaska for a few years and up in Fairbanks and and uh, have known a lot of those low-lying areas and uh, of terrain that it's very hard to um, establish what you know their accurate temperature is or a good forecast for temperature. Um, so as the RTMA is is pretty robust currently for uh, temperature, it doesn't work uh, the greatest in Alaska uh, and I, uh, that capacity as well. So I'm uh, looking forward to that that. Uh, New uh, our second year work to get started here uh, sometime later this year. Uh, RTMA does have the potential to support low-level remote area operations where certified weather observations aren't available, and uh, the funding um, has also been provided. Uh, in addition to the RTMA funding that we have, we're looking at funding uh, some more developments within the VOS project itself. Uh, next slide, if you don't mind. I didn't take over as presenter there. And I'd like to uh, pass uh, uh, the next uh, set of slides off to Walter. OK, can you hear me? We've got you loud and clear. Oh, nice. OK, so I also have the slides up, and I've taken over as the presenter, I believe. Um, so the new silver standard, uh, now that I just lost the slides, guys, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to revert to my backup. We've still got them. You're on slide 12. Okay. Okay. So the new silver standard, as Gordy had mentioned, uh, is the, it, for the weather camera program is, is the VWAS system. Uh, the VWAS is a, it's a modernized platform. We're using IP telecommunications. Uh, we're using uh, uh, up-to-date, advanced hardware, software, and even some automation that uh, that that outstrips the current AWAS systems that are out there. The VWAS is going to be a non-certified platform. It's supplemental weather observations uh, that it will provide for <clears throat> um, for aviation, and and it, it, it and that is that in lies the the silver standard where the system is uh, it self-validates, it uh, self-reports when a sensor goes out or when a data um, uh, product is it is invalid or is flagged as invalid, it sends a report immediately to the operational maintenance platform uh, where it is then dispositioned for uh, maintenance and restoral. The, the cost of the system is about a tenth of the cost of an AWOS, and, uh, it, uh, and we should be able to install up to 100 systems in, in about a five-year time frame. So the VWAS platform is, consists of um, a 360-degree camera that will be placed on, on top of a pole or a tower at the location. It won't always be directly connected or, or uh, installed on the VWAS platform itself, but it will be adjacent to that VWAS platform so that you get a 360-degree view of an airport, for instance, and you get um, your you get you get a, a METAR-like product that has uh, visibility, uh, vis sensor, uh, ceiling, pressure, uh, and all the all the other products that come with a with a um, uh, with a METAR. So. Um, we like to call it the whole picture. When you add a METAR or you add this weather information from the VWAS, the, that product is called a VOBS. So when you add VOBS with a camera, you end up getting what we call the whole picture. <clears throat> the VWAS platform, like I had mentioned earlier, uh, provides 
not only camera images, but now it's going to provide at locations where an AWOS does not exist, it will provide its own ceiling, vis, pressure, temperature, humidity, rainfall, and other products uh, that are, that are um, resident on the platform itself. Like I had mentioned before, it is an advisory weather system, and it enhances uh, the industry standards um, with, uh, with uh, 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 excuse me, it enhances the industry's, uh, the National Weather Service forecasts uh, and other weather products. <clears throat> we use the same sensors. We're using, like I said, IP telecommunications, cloud networking, uh, and we make all of our data available through APIs that will be available to the industry at large. So the way we're going to present our weather is that the, there will be a camera facility, or excuse me, camera equipment, camera views, and what we're calling the new um, uh, uh, I'm sorry about this, guys. I'm having a distraction, and it's bothering me here. It's tripping me up. Uh, we have a we have a new weather display that um, provides trends, current OBS, and forecasts. <clears throat> and this is going to be the way we display our information on our website. In this image, you, you can see that we've got the the traditional camera system that uh, provides the four camera view wedges from this location at locations where we have a VWAS and the 360 camera system that will be a single view all the way around. You'll be able to pan, tilt, and zoom through that image. So just, just for your information, uh, this is updating pretty slowly, and I'm, it's kind of struggling with, the, uh, with this uh, Skype meeting. So just wanted to let you guys know that. So the benefits of the weather camera program, it's effective, it's accurate, validated weather observation data, it supports the um, aviation operations wherever METARs don't exist. It enables National Weather Service forecasts, like I had mentioned before. Um, some of the different products, like terminal area forecasts, area forecasts, RTMA. It's low cost. Like I said earlier, it gets uh, it, uh, it Cost is approximately 10% of, of an AWOS or an ASOS system, and it'll allow us to establish systems faster and, and at much lower cost. And it's responsive, responsive. It's uh, um, we can install 20 systems a year, and, and we can establish weather system, weather data where AWOS systems don't exist. Okay, so let's talk about the test. So in May, we're going to install our hardware at Palmer. We currently have our 360 camera operating at Palmer uh, that's on our internal network, and we're testing and developing and working with the camera manufacturer to enhance the camera systems such that uh, it will, it will uh, improve uh, to a large degree the, the clarity of the images as well as some of the functionality, night vision, uh, night, uh, night vision, uh, we, we call it starlight vision capability will also be, uh, will accompany this new system. We, we'll install that system in, in May, uh, the VWAS itself, the, the weather sensors, and in June we'll start an operational test where we're going to compare the AWOS against the VWAS. Flight services will, will provide an operational review of the system, and they will also provide a tertiary report every hour so that we have a comparison against VWAS, AWAS, and of course the, the human interpreter of, of that weather. And then uh, we're also soliciting volunteer pilots and, and, uh, and aviation operators to assist us with this test and development of this system. This, this, uh, this test will run between uh, starting in June and, and through the end of September. After September, we, we intend to install the VWAS at three different airports uh, out there in, in somewhere in Alaska where AWAS doesn't exist, but we have commercial operations and, and a high interest in 
in testing this data, this not only the data but also the operations and uses of the system itself. One of the things we foresee happening with this new 360 camera capability is the ability for flight managers such as flight services, uh, dispatchers, and flight followers to be able to participate, if you will, with, with with pilots, so there'll be an enhanced interaction between the flight management groups and and pilots themselves, where they can, when they call in to to get a report or an update on uh, the weather conditions at an airport, for instance, prior to approach, um, the flight manager clicks on the image, gets an instant snapshot of the 360 degree um, environment around it, that airport, and it it, it it allows them to, to virtually uh, transport themselves to the site. In other words, they will have not only all the views in the 360-degree uh, array, but they will also have all of the weather data necessary, ceiling, viz, pressure, winds, and, and other products that are necessary uh, to, uh, to, to provide to the pilots on their approach. Um, let's see. So for VWAS 21 and beyond, um, so for right now we're going to run that test through the summer, through uh, the spring summer time frame of 2021, and after that, then we will assess its effectiveness, and we will then go back to the agency to find funding to establish these systems at about 100 locations across the state. Those are locations will be areas where VWAS, excuse me, where AWAS and ASOS do not exist, but where there's an industry need uh, for weather at those airports. So primarily we're targeting airports with this next 100 sites. We're also going to take this new system and we're going to develop a VFR, this VFR standard that we were talking about, the VFR Weather Network. And what's nice about this, or what, what, well, the way we envision it is right now, uh, the AWOS and the METAR is the gold standard, and all the other weather out there uh, is just that, just other weather. What we want to do is, is develop a new capability for the industry to provide their own systems under this, under this silver, silver standard, where the system self-checks and self-validates its accuracy. Um, as soon as we're done with that, then we're going to turn around and provide that. When, once we've built this, we'll turn around and hand the specification off to the industry and let them uh, begin to build their own and manage their own systems under this new capability, this VFR weather network. I think with that, I'll leave it to questions and answers. Hi, everybody. This is Mary. Um, thanks, everybody, for your questions. Let's start with Gordy. What is the source for the 78.5 square mile service volume for the AWASs? And would you know the coverage for the continental U.S.? Well, we just did the math on the, on the, uh, the five uh, statute mile. Uh, radius around a, uh, around an AWAS. It's generally what a an AWAS is valid for, um, and the coverage for the lower 40. I think Scott put it in there is roughly around 95 percent. So it's significantly more. But I, the the point I guess being is that the vast majority of the United States and Alaska. The focus has always been on air care operations at larger, air, air, larger airports, rough, primarily 139 airports. And so the smaller locations and or the remote operations, they just, they just don't have the appropriate weather information. You know, we really see the VWAS as the, a way to fill those gaps. And ultimately, ultimately we'd like to see a, uh, the weather service provide us with RTMA data that would be good enough uh, for low-level remote operations, and and so that that's kind of the goal here. In Alaska, the the beauty of Alaska is the legislation has allowed us, the FAA, put us in the driver's seat is to say what's good enough. 
So um, we are we are benchmarking the VWAS against the AWAS, uh, and, and that will be our standard uh, since it uses the same uh, the, the same sensors or, or similar sensors. We feel it's going to measure up actually. Uh, but right now we're we're going to hold it to a, a VFR a VFR network, and um, I think there are other questions along that lines too. So I'll stop there. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question for John about the RTMA. Is there a location or repository where reference materials and documents can be obtained so that industry can propose solutions that might meet minimum standards that could be required by the FAA or the National Weather Service? Sorry there, it took me a second to unmute. Um, I don't know. I don't know if there any of that information um, is shareable, or, or I can I can take that question and, and get back to the group. So if I can have a, a list of all the folks that are attended today, I can I can send a, a reply back. But I, I I don't have an answer to that question at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, can I ask a more basic question then? Do pilots currently have access to the RTMA today? Yes, there's access to RTMA. Um, I want to say that's through the Aviation Weather Center uh, website there where um, RTMA, I know the temperature uh, is used and, and I, can't, I can't point directly to uh, uh, the tab there, but it, that's where um, it could be found on the AWC site. Yeah, from, this is Gordy from Flight Standards. So we've approved the, the use of RTMA temperature in lieu of AWOS or ASOS temperature. Um, and, and there's an actual lookup table, if you, um, and it's, it's kind of archaic way of getting the data. Um, uh, but that was kind of a, a, a short, you know, fuse. Let's, let's, try to, let's try to figure out some way, to, you know, for missing temperature sensors because it seemed to be low hanging fruit. So we get to the basic analysis of our team and said, yeah, it's good enough. Um, this is a, a considerably more in-depth analysis, and we, as part of this uh, phase two, we're going to be looking at how we will display the information, whether we will ask the Weather Service uh, to provide it in, in a more easily usable format. Right now, they've got a website, and, and David, I, I know, uses that or knows, knows where it is, but uh, it, it's really meant for the forecaster. Um, if we were to go live with something like that, we would probably want a, a better user interface. So uh, Walter is also looking at the possibility of hosting the data on his site. Uh, but that's kind of yet to be determined how it will be, you know, how it will be accessed and to what level it can or should be used. But we have to do our due diligence. So we have to, we have to determine how good it is. Um, realize that it's, it's not necessarily ground truth, okay? It's, it's model data, but it's based on ground truth. And, and so there will be some variability in it. Um, and for example, let's take the eastern region of the United States that's saturated with ASOS and a, AWOS and ASOS. Our TMA is probably very, very accurate. Um, but when, as you start to get into areas, and if you go back to one of my slides, the slide that showed the sparsity of the AWOS, our TMA is probably going to have some significant variability. Uh, and, and terrain is uh, obviously a major feature. So, um, you know, we're, we, we feel if we, if we put the two together uh, and start filling the gaps with some, uh, with some validated weather observations, uh, our TMA is just going to get better. So that's kind of the goal there. Thank you. Um, further along the lines of our TMA data, the National Weather Service Alaska region has been evaluating its performance and has noted some data quality issues, particularly with temperature. Can you describe the type of data quality that would be acceptable from RTMA and what elements you foresee using from it in the future? We, we are looking at basically what we call the big six. Uh, without, um, Minus present weather, okay, so it's uh, C 
ceiling visibility, temperature, dew point, wind speed, and direction. So those, those elements are being evaluated, and we're benchmarking it against the AWOS. Now, we know it's not going to meet the AWOS standard. We, we know that the, the visibility, for example, on the AWOS is plus or minus a quarter mile. We know it won't be that, and we are not going to say that RTMA will fill the gaps to do CAT-3 approaches at uh, Anchorage at, uh, International Airport. Um, however, we, we need to find out how good it is because it might be good enough for, uh, you know, for uh, VFR operations in remote areas. It might be good enough to fly an instrument approach in, uh, in some areas that are missing weather information. So there's two pieces of the RTMA analysis. We're looking at whether, one, it can be used to, to fill in for missing uh, sensors when a sensor is gone on an AWOS or ASOS, and two, we're looking at it, how good is it regionalized? How, how good is it in regions? And, and what is its variability? Now, we, we can only assume that this is going to continue to get better and better and better. And more, the, the more information they put into RTMA, the better it's going to get. And we know that we've had feedback, too, that, that some of the RTMA temperatures are, uh, are not, not accurate. Um, and, and those that, that we, we, we see probably a direct correlation to that with uh, the lack of weather sensors, uh, approved weather sensors in and around that, that area in, in the first place. So um, long, long and short of it, yeah, we're, we're planning to do this, but we see RTMA as, as a potential uh, way forward in a lot of areas to kind of bridge the gap, if you will, for missing weather information and possibly uh, be a uh, a part of the solution for uh, low-level remote operations. Thank you. Uh, Walter, will the 360-degree camera replace the existing multiple camera views at locations in the future? And there is a concern that the resiliency of one camera will not be enough. is going to be placed at locations, typically airports, uh, where the additional functionality uh, is required for both uh, pilots as, as well as uh, the flight managers uh, to, to, to make those proper um, approach decisions, landing, takeoff, that kind of thing. So that's the purpose behind it. Uh, the, the interesting thing that, that the, that question would be asked with uh, with regard to a single camera. What this camera is actually consists of is 16 total cameras, camera lenses on four camera bodies. So our typical or our standard is four cameras at every location. We still have four camera bodies, but with new technology, we're able to we're able to um, attached to those camera bodies, four lenses per camera body. So we end up with 16 lenses in total. Uh, eight of those lenses are a daytime, you know, the standard um, type of camera image that you're going to get, color daytime image. And then the other eight are night vision. So there's a lot of there's a lot of redundancy built into this system where every one of the views overlap each other. So if we lose one camera, the overlap is picked up by other cameras. And if there's a hole, then the, the night vision camera picks up and fills in that hole. So it's quite a quite an ingenious little uh, contraption that we've dreamed up and that we're building right now. And uh, I don't think that we're going to have any problems with uh, with outages. In fact, we, we believe it's going to be more robust, quite quite a bit more robust than the current system that we've got. So can I verify each of those cameras operates independently? Each one of them operates, yes, independently. Now again, there's four cameras. There's, there's four cameras. This is this is a concept that's a little bit yeah, we have to try to understand and is there's still four camera bodies, but each one of those camera bodies is fitted with four lenses. So there's there's a lot of redundancy there, and they do operate those four bodies 
to operate independently of each other. Uh, the images are stitched together in, during the processing of uh, of the images in in a separate unit. So there's there's no single source of failure, uh, to put it that way. Okay, great, thank you. Next question. Can the VWAS be used for operational decision making or is it only for situational awareness? And would this be applicable to part 121 and part 135? Well, that's the beauty uh, of it. And that's what we're doing. Well, go ahead, Gordy. No, I was say that. I, I can take it as far as, as far as will it be allowed in that. Uh, and I saw that from you, Beth, and I appreciate that, that question. And the, the, the long and the short of it is, Probably, um, most likely, it will be. Um, as Walter goes through this validation this year, we'll be collecting data and matching it up to the to the AWAS. And we we fully expect to get some very good uh, alignment with the AWAS uh, information as far as being ground truth. And once we have that, we will be able to uh, easily. Uh, allow that that for operations in Alaska, you know, based on the legislation that's out there. So, um, the short answer is that's the goal. And not holding you to that, but would you have any expectation or idea when that might be a reality? Well, the, the VWAS is is uh, is right now just. Uh, um, I mean, Walter actually has it running. Um, and the so 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 it is it is a, a real a real system, um, but funding will need to be um, obtained to to roll this out. So basically, what what we've got now is we're proving the concept, and we've we've got some funding to do the uh, analysis work and the validation this year uh, into next year. Uh, and as Walter said, you could put in. Um, uh, I forget the number a year, Walter. What, what, what were you saying? How many could you install per year? Uh, Twenty to twenty-five a year. Okay. And, and so, and, and that, and, and the uh, the location of that too. The location of that. I mean, we, we obviously want to pick the low-hanging fruit. We want. We'd like to cover those airports that that already have instrument approaches without weather. So you know, normally that would be year one, but. You know, as far as the um, uh, where this where this goes, we, we would have to work with the weather service and uh, and you folks in Alaska to, to determine what would be a priority, um, and then you know work that through Walter. So that's really Walter's um, you know his management of the of the program, and we're hoping with flight standards to to really push this forward, get all the FAORs in the water, and and, and move this uh, move this program on. Okay, thank you. Something definitely to look forward to. Will VWAS have a present weather sensor? And there are concerns that this will be important in winter, and particularly uh, we'll need a capability to detect freezing rain. Uh, yes, that's one of the that's one of the sensors that we do have on our platform right now, and we are testing. Uh, so yes, it will have a present weather sensor. Thank you. The next question is, uh, is the VWAS still being tested by the FAA Tech Center? And is it ongoing? Or if the testing is complete, what was the outcome? While the VWAS is being tested by the Weather Camera Program, we have the Tech Center on task to help us with that. Uh, but right now, it's in its infancy. We have one assembled; it's operating, and we're working with with Vaisla is the is the company that's building our sensors, just like the AWAS sensors. And we're working with Vaisla to perfect that. We will engage with the tech center uh, in the future, but they aren't currently working with us on that test. The the initial test again is going to be from June through September. And then beyond September, from September into the March to June time frame of, the fall of next year, we will do a, what we're calling a demonstration of capability. 
at those at three locations across somewhere out in the state, uh, like I mentioned, where there are commercial uh, and aviation operations going on, but there's no weather at those at those locations. So that's 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 the essence of the testing and demonstration that we're doing. After that, that's when we'll pull in the tech center and some of the uh, some of the analysts to take a look at the system, take a look at the data uh, and all of our analysis and determine if the VWAS operates in compliance with FAA rules and regulations and if it can be included as a METAR or as, you know, as a certified weather product. Okay, thank you. The next question also concerns testing. Is there an email address or a website where pilots can apply to participate in testing? Well, we haven't gotten quite that far, um, but that is something that we will do. And, and we haven't really figured out what was going to be the best way to, to reach out to those organizations that do want to participate. Uh, you know, the, the uh, on on one hand, the more the merrier, but uh, but on the other hand, we want to bring in you know uh, organizations that are going to be uh, committed to the test uh, and demonstration as well. So we still have to figure out some of those details, but it's on our mind, and we are working toward that. And do you have any idea when you might reach that phase where you're looking for participation from pilots? Sure, we'll start. We're, we'll actually start reaching out just before the first of June. So we want by September we want to have all of those details put together and, and that test team put together. Perfect, thank you. Next question is also from a pilot's perspective. If there's a location that has both an AWOS and a VWAS, which information should the pilot use primarily? We don't intend to install a VWAS where an AWOS is. Uh, uh, the AWOS is the gold standard. So the agency doesn't want to put money into a location where we've got a, a, a certified system. So VWAS is specific to those locations where AWOS does not exist, but weather data is, is critical to have. And, and it's a low cost. The, the purpose is it's, it's low cost. And, and we can populate, if there's 100 locations, and we can do uh, each location, say, for $125,000 as opposed to a $1 million, uh, the, the, it starts making sense quickly to put these VWASs in where AWAS isn't required. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, we have one last question. And it is. So if there won't be a VWAS at AWAS locations, will the weather camera program still be upgrading all camera sites with the 360 degree technology? Well, it's our intention to install a 360 camera everywhere there is an AWAS. And of course, with a VWAS, it comes resident. So yes, everywhere there's an AWAS, we'll get, you'll get an upgrade with a 360 degree camera. Okay, great, thank you. Unless anybody has any further questions, I think we've answered them all. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Mary. Well, I think that pretty much wraps up uh, this particular presentation. I want to thank our presenters today and uh, Mary O'Connor for fielding the questions. And we will, we like say, hopefully, if I haven't screwed up, we've recorded this presentation. We'll get it posted on a website and uh, share a link with uh, the people that were originally invited to this and anybody else would like to, to watch it. Uh, Dave Kosovar, any last words? No, I do not. Thank you, everyone, for attending and um, for all the, the questions. And thank you to the speakers um, for the time that they put in to, to, to present this information to everybody. 
Okay, with that, thanks for signing on, and we will uh, hopefully be doing some additional sessions down the road on some topics, and again, looking toward a possible fall conference if we can get back into the face-to-face -face world. So thank you very much for your participation, and we'll see you down the road. Bye now. Thank you, Tom.